So I'm kind of curious about, like, I mean, your history. It seems like you've been doing triathlon, like, almost like, you know, like Hunter Kemper started when he was, you know, tall enough to ride a bike. Right. And that seems to be pretty similar for you, right? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I started doing triathlon, like, like I would enter like the kids triathlons, like the mm. little ones. I, you know, I swam on a summer team. I ran at the track every so often mm. whenever I was younger and I would just happen to do like hop in some of the kids triathlon races. And yeah. And so, yeah, I've been, I mean, doing it for quite a while. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, I'd say like, competitive to Lee though like where I really just primarily focused on like becoming a better triathlete it wasn't until like the end of high school so mm -hmm. I like I was swimming and running um for my high school team and then I do like triathlon in the summer um but then like finally by my senior year of high school I decided to kind of relinquish a couple of things and just focus entirely on triathlon mm -hmm. yeah it's just like a do you remember like how you were introduced to the sport it seems like a lot of people in the sport of transplants like me like I ran through college and then transplanted yeah. to triathlon not a whole lot of people are like you and Hunter that started when they were very very young so I mean yeah. how do you get introduced to it at, at that age yeah it was I mean mostly my dad I mean my dad still competes now but he has been competing for a long time and it just kind of growing up and seeing him compete it's kind of motivating to become a triathlete myself mm -hmm. so I would say that would be almost entirely the reason why I started at such a young age. Um, yeah. So. And I think, uh, Chris had said, I think I saw on your, your blog as well. You went to Penn state for undergrad, correct? Correct. Yeah. And, and you did not like run for the school, but you participated in the, the triathlon club. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So my big question is, I, I think you're a fast enough runner, maybe even fast enough swimmer. You probably could have had scholarships to schools. So, like, how do you turn down? Like, where's the decision, or was there a decision about turning down scholarships to run somewhere or like go to a school versus you know continue to pursue, pursue triathlon? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, honestly, I so um, I don't think that I was fast enough running or swimming to do that at a, like a competitive division one school like a right, right. like a like a uh, power five conference really right and, and so but i wanted to stay like within the state and because it's really hard to get scholarship money and i also wanted to just um go to a school with good academics mm -hmm. and penn state had great academics they had a track record of having a good a decent triathlon program like at least there was like a team there, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, my, now some of my best friends are, were on that team as well. And so like, it was just a good fit as far as like, well, I can do triathlon, but I'm also going to be getting a good degree while going to a good school. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, are they, are they, um, picking up the, the NCAA women's triathlon at Penn state? I haven't been following that too deeply, but I know like they're, trying it out at schools and yeah it seemed like the club schools were kind of what they were focusing on initially yeah it's yeah schools are definitely picking it up penn state i don't think is as mm. far as i'm aware of um there's not a ton of division one schools that are but um yeah that's i i don't think penn state is necessarily I'm not okay. entirely sure all the schools that are so yeah um so one of the things I think all, like a lot of endurance athletes deal with, and I saw tons of my teammates, I'm sure you're familiar with teammates that are this way, is like dealing with burnout because you have yeah. to put it so many hours. It's so repetitive. And, you know, considering you started from such a young age, like have you ever felt burnt out? Like how do you deal with that or how do you avoid that? Yeah, I. it's tough to say. I mean, I think that I was competitive, but I wasn't like, overly competitive in the sense that I was like especially like through high school say I wasn't doing uh, you know three workouts a day through high school I you know I'd do like you know nine maybe workouts a week mm -hmm. I was you know training what I felt was hard but I wasn't overworking myself 
Mm-hmm. And then generally, like all my coaches through high school were big proponents of just taking time off, like absolutely nothing. And I think that is a good way to just kind of reset every year and make sure that you aren't, you know, day in, day out for years and years and years, just destroying yourself doing the same thing, just taking that time off. And then whenever, especially in high school, like those few years, I would be primarily focused on like just running and for like during the cross country season Mm -hmm. and primarily focused on swimming during the swim season. And so I think that having that variation throughout the year also helped just avoid burning out. So just a little bit of time. Yeah. Um, This is another thing like Cody Beals talks about and I kind of asked you a little bit about him, but yeah, not real familiar. And I spoke with, um, Matt Bach, who whose episodes just came out in dealing with like um, pretty common for a lot of endurance athletes that are men and some women like dealing with low testosterone. Have you ever dealt with that or like that like super fatigue that kind of comes along with like hormone imbalance? No, I no I haven't had anything quite like that. There's definitely been days I felt fatigued, but yeah, <laughs> I think we've all been there at some point or another. Yeah, it's this, like, interesting line between trying to figure out, like, am I fatigued because I've worked myself so far into a hole that now I have, like, hormone issues, or is it regular fatigue? And I think it's easy for, you know, especially for most of those guys that end up, turns out that they have issues, is, like, they write it off as just, oh, it's just normal fatigue. Right. But, like, it seems to be something that's cropping up more and more, so some of those, like, started to ask people about, just because it seems like more common than you think it would be right yeah i yeah i'm not entirely sure i've really ever come across that necessarily i think Mm. i think i've been able to like just know where my body's at enough so that i can avoid getting to that level of like chronic like really just absolutely destroyed Mm. um so yeah luck thankfully i've been able to mostly avoid that issue Good deal. Um, this is one thing like, you know, we talked about being a pro and earning a living and, and you do have, or at least on your website, you still have some sponsors listed. Um, so I think there's kind of some mystery surrounding sponsors for like age groupers and they, they're, mm-hmm. you know, they don't understand how that works. So I'm curious, like at least from your experience, like, how does the the process go about finding sponsors or working with sponsors? Um, you know, how does that relationship um, occur? Yeah, uh, usually the spon like usually it's more about like knowing someone and uh, getting in touch with them, sending them email, letting them know your credentials, whether that's your athletic resume or your social media resume, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And usually you can get get sponsors. I say sponsors pretty easily, but what that sponsorship entails is can vary a wide range. So like, Mm -hmm. you know, you can get a clothing sponsor. Is that clothing sponsor sending you a dozen shirts and tights or whatever? Probably not. They're probably giving you like 30% off retail, Mm -hmm. uh, which is like, yeah, technically that's a sponsor. But I mean, as far as like making a professional triathlete, it's not really helping you all that much. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, usually what happens uh, like that I've seen is uh, sponsors generally pick up athletes um, with both a good athletic uh, background, good social media background. But that first year or two may not necessarily be like a full on sponsorship where they're giving you money, um, you know, every year or bonuses, that kind of thing. They'll start off with like, Hey, here's, you know, you try our product and then you keep, you show that like you're an asset to us and then we'll continue on that sponsorship or give you more, um, with each passing year. Mm -hmm. And then other times it works the opposite. Sometimes, you know, a sponsor decides that they just don't want to sponsor everyone, sponsor as many athletes and you're just cut and you may not, may not have done anything wrong. You just, that's just kind of the nature that you were already at the bottom of the total pool mm-hmm. and you just got cut. So. So it's, it's like, so I, I'm always curious about it just personally too. Um, since I run a couple of businesses, one of them being athletically focused. 
Yeah. Um, and I don't sponsor anybody at the moment um, just for my own marketing reasons. But, you know, so I kind of think about it in both aspects. Like I am on the athletic side. I'm on, you know, the, the company side too. It seems like social media would be such a big deal now, you know, because so many sales take place online and ultimately – the idea of sponsorships is to, you know, convey a brand to new people and wind up, you know, selling product. Um, so it's like, here's like a seventh or eighth discipline for you is like <laughs> dealing with social media, like learning how yeah. to garner an audience and, and market to that audience without alienating them. And Oh, yeah. No, that's huge. Yeah, for sure. So the big question now, and I'll put you on the spot is, where's your social media presence like? You know, no, you, you I'm just giving you a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I, you know, like just, I mean, I, I don't know, just not interested in posting all my aspects of my life. I, yeah. I don't know, just kind of enjoy like not having to worry about that. It's yeah. definitely an aspect that I do not miss about, you know, more or less trying to make it as a professional. Like that's like just not who I am. Right. Like I just right. don't like, advertising myself. I mean, not that like I think that everyone that posts about themselves is like advertising for themselves. It's just right. like it's just kind of my personality. I just don't like talking about that stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm with you. Like, I don't know if I'm sure you've seen this where it's like somebody will post about whatever product and it comes off very like salesy. And it's just yeah. like, do you even like the product? Right. It's not authentic. You know? Yeah. Like, it, so I, that's the other thing I think about, too, is it's kind of almost antagonistic situation where like say say i come to you and i say mike i want to give you five thousand dollars if you'll you know post about my products and you're like well i hate your products but i really want the five thousand dollars right and that's tough that's yeah. tough right? especially if you're like uh if you're an up-and-coming professional athlete and you really like want to make it and mm -hmm. you see that opportunity like i mean more you're more than likely probably going to take that deal yeah yeah, and when that's and I know, you know, again, come from the company side, like it's tough. At least for me, I can't speak for like the big brands. Yeah. Why is somebody pounding on my wall right now? <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Um, <laughs> gotta figure that out in a minute. Yeah. Um, so come from the company side, it's like I know not everybody's gonna like what I make. That's okay. But right. it's like the people speaking about it, I have like a relationship with, I want them to like it too. Mm -hmm. So it's like you want to get the word out, but you also don't want people to be disingenuous. Right. So, you know, I can see from, like I said, that both sides, that, that antagonistic coin where it's like, how do you find the right person that likes your products and would post about them, you know, without being paid? Right. And then the payment's just like, you know, bonus on top. Yeah. No, so, yeah, that would be ideal, but I it just doesn't seem to happen quite that way all the time. Yeah, no, and the, and that's fine. I mean, that's 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 business. It's just it's just a curiosity of how things work. And with with you know influencers being so big right now, that's like the big buzz term in all these marketing forums. Got to find influencers. Got to find influencers. It's like, do I? You know, the, this is the idea is to try to find. You're trying to replicate word of mouth marketing, but you're yeah. paying for it. Right. So 